This morning our reading comes from Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 1. You can find it on page 1026 in the Pew Bibles. We'll begin reading from verse 26 through to verse 38. So Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, on page 1026, uh, beginning at verse 26. Let's hear God's word. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How, how will this be? Mary asked the angel. Since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. Let it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. And this is God's word. Well, let's pray as we come to God's Word. This is the one I esteem, the Lord says. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Our Father, as we come to your Word today, we pray that we might be those humble people who take your Word and receive it into our hearts. And we pray that we might be those people that you lift high. For your glories and our goodness sake, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's something about Mary, uh, said uh, a line of a popular comedy film that I haven't uh, seen myself as far as I can remember. But there is something about Mary, isn't there? There's something about Mary that perhaps attracts us and perhaps that we feel nervous about. Uh, Mary, after all, has been a controversial figure, sadly, in the church because some will want to uh, venerate her so much that others of us will feel a little bit nervous whenever we talk about Mary at all. But we're beginning a series of uh, three scripture readings in Luke's Gospel uh, to this morning and then in the morning and the evening after Christmas next week um, from Luke's Gospel. And all of these readings have Mary featured prominently in them. It seems as though one of the things Luke is doing as he wants to tell us the story of the first Christmas is to tell us something about Mary. He wants to put put her before our eyes, if you like, so that we can learn something from her. And I think the thing that Luke is wanting to show us about Mary is her faith. Um, If you turn back to Luke chapter 1 and have a look at a verse we didn't read, verse 45. Uh, This is what Elizabeth says to Mary uh, when, Elizabeth, when Mary comes to Elizabeth's house, uh, Mary's cousin Elizabeth says to Mary, Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. So we read in our scripture reading, the angel Gabriel comes to Mary with this amazing news that she is going to have a child who is going to be called the Son of God Most High. And Mary wants to know how that's going to happen 
And the angel tells her that the Holy Spirit is going to cause her to conceive uh, without the help of any uh, human father. And to help Mary to believe that, the angel points to Elizabeth, her cousin, who has also received this amazing news that she is going to be pregnant in her old age. And so Mary takes the hint and goes and travels to see Elizabeth. And as uh, they greet each other, Elizabeth comes out with this great uh, blessing and praise for Mary. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. It looks as though that one of the big things that Luke is trying to draw our attention to in our scripture reading today is Mary's faith. There's something about Mary's faith that we can learn from as a kind of a model, as an example for us to follow. And so what I want to do this morning is simply look at how Mary responds to the good news that the angel brings her. And I think the best way to do that is to look at the two replies that Mary makes to the angel's words. So verse 34 and verse 38. So the first thing then comes in verse 34. Uh, Mary receives this promise that she is going to be the mother of one who is going to be called Son of the Most High. And she replies, verse 34, How will this be since I am a virgin? And I want to suggest that this shows the stupidity of faith. True faith, you could say, is stupid. Now, you might say, well, well Sam, you're not really saying anything new here. We know that faith is stupid. We, we feel it and we hear it all the time. Uh, the Australian journalist and visiting fellow at King's College London uh, wrote this year, uh, that uh, Greg Sheridan wrote this year, that most British people seem to take it on faith, that to have faith is stupid. And perhaps you feel like that. Perhaps you're a Christian here today and you feel sort of as though when you go into society it feels pretty stupid to be a believing person. Or perhaps you're here today and you're somebody who wouldn't call yourself a Christian believer and you're sort of half wondering why we're doing what we're doing here today. Why are we reading from the Bible? Why are we baptizing a baby with water? Why are we doing these strange things? You might say, if you were really pushed, it's stupid. Now, Mary's question uh, does highlight, I think, how stupid she is about to look. She's being told that she is going to give birth to a child without the help, it seems, of a human father. And she says, well, how's this going to be since I am a virgin? And of course, in her society, and still today, if she gives birth uh, without any kind of husband and without any marriage, she's going to look very stupid. But that's not quite what I mean when I say that faith is stupid. To see what I mean, you need to realise that this is actually not the first time in Luke's Gospel that an angel called Gabriel has come and given somebody a bit of a fright and then told them, fear not, and then gone on to give them the promise of a miraculous birth. We've already seen it, if we've been reading through Luke's Gospel, just uh, a few verses earlier. So turn back to the first page of Luke's Gospel, and the story of Zechariah. So Zechariah is Elizabeth's husband, and he receives this promise from the angel Gabriel that he and Elizabeth are going to have a son called John, even though they're well past childbearing age. And these stories are so similar that, in fact, Zechariah then makes the same sort of response that Mary does. Verse 18, he asks a question. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well on in years. So whenever you see two stories like this in the Bible that have so many similarities put right next to each other, you've really got to ask, what is going on here? Luke's inviting us to compare these stories of these two people who receive messages from angels, respond very similarly. But here's where the stories start to change. Have a look at how the angel responds to Zechariah's question. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. 
So there's a bit of a puzzle here, isn't there? Zechariah and Mary both ask questions, but clearly there's a very different response from the angel. The angel Gabriel very clearly tells Zechariah, you have not believed my words. Well, what's wrong with what Zechariah says? Well, I've been sort of pondering this a bit and trying to, trying to figure this out. And here's what I think is going on. When Zechariah is told that he and Elizabeth, although they're very old, well past childbearing age, are going to have a son, there's a precedent for that. If you know your Old Testament at all, you'll know the story of Abraham and Sarah and how they were given the promise that they would give birth to a child, Isaac, to continue the family line. Now, we know that Zechariah knew this because, firstly, he was actually a descendant of Abraham and Sarah. He he was descended from Isaac. He was also a priest, highly trained in the scriptures, one of the elite uh, intellectual people of his society. But we even know that even more explicitly because Luke actually uses the exact phrase um, that Abraham used. When Abraham received a message that he was going to have a son, he too said, how can I be sure of this? And that is the same question that Zechariah asks centuries later. So Zechariah knows exactly what has happened to Abraham and Sarah. And so you can sort of imagine him sort of maybe quite piously quoting scripture, thinking, oh, I know what to say in this situation. I've read about this. I'm meant to say, how can I be sure of this? Just like Abraham did. But of course, he's meant to, he doesn't need to ask that question because the answer to the question has already been answered. We already know that God can help elderly people well past childbearing age give birth to a child if that is part of his purpose. Zechariah should know that. He shouldn't be going around quoting scripture piously. He should be saying, wow, thank you. He should be believing. But what he seems to be doing is saying, I've got all the knowledge, quoting scripture left, right, and center, but he hasn't got faith. He's not allowing what he knows of God's revelation in the Bible and in history to actually affect his heart. So that, it seems to me, is what's wrong with Zechariah. He's he's got knowledge without faith. And that, I think, invites us to look a little bit more carefully at Mary's question. So turn back over And let's try and understand how Mary's question is different. Mary's question, I think, is different because, firstly, she is being told something totally unprecedented. She is being told that she's going to give birth to a son who will be called the Son of the Most High. I mean, that is remarkable in itself. That's much bigger than what Zechariah was being told. But there's also no mention of any human father here. And so it seems that Mary is perfectly within her rights to sort of say, well, how? How's that going to happen? Mary, it seems to me, is not sort of saying, no way, Jose. She's actually simply asking for a bit more clarity. She's not questioning this. She's simply saying, well, there seems to be a bit missing. Can you tell me a bit more? And that's the way that the angel takes her question, because he then does give her more clarity. He explains how this conception is going to happen without a human father. Verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So it seems to me that Mary is showing herself to be genuinely pious here. She doesn't question what she's told, even though it's boggling to her. She accepts the basic thing, and then she asks for more information. She's seeking more understanding. And that's what I mean when I say that faith is stupid. There's a certain sense in which part of having faith is accepting things that you don't fully get while seeking more understanding. Now, it's not news to us that having faith uh, involves looking stupid, but perhaps it is surprising to be reminded that that's actually a good thing. That's something for us to imitate, to kind of be like Mary, to be asking these questions um, and, and maybe not knowing all the answers. 
We want to embrace, this passage suggests, the stupidity of faith as part of what true faith is. So here's uh, what John Calvin has to say about this, uh, the reformer. He says, it is the peculiar virtue of faith that we should willingly be fools in order that we may learn to be wise only from the mouth of God. When we're believers, we're willingly becoming fools. We're humbling ourselves so that we can learn what God says to us that's far beyond our ability to, to work out by ourselves. Now, I'm not saying when I say that faith is stupid, that faith is simply about asking questions, sort of constantly asking questions and not ever having any answers. I don't think so. Because Mary does, for example, not question at all that God exists. She doesn't question at all that, that God could have a son. And she doesn't question at all that God's son could become a human being in her womb. She doesn't question any of those things, which are amazing, central um, truths of Christianity. She accepts those. But she's still got other questions. And so we want to be careful when we say faith involves asking questions. I don't mean to say it's just asking questions endlessly. But what it is saying is that there's a certain stupidity to faith, which means we don't know all the answers. We accept what we can while still having other questions. So faith is stupid, but I'm not saying it's, it's, it's just asking questions. But I'm also not saying that faith being stupid means that you sort of have to pull your brain out and put it in a glass jar if you become a Christian. Uh, that's the sort of thing that uh, Richard Dawkins would have us believe. Um, I read this morning an essay or a letter he wrote to his 10-year-old daughter. Uh, telling, he, he says he doesn't want to indoctrinate her, he wants to teach her how to think. And basically what he says to her is you need to have evidence for everything that you believe. That's what scientists do. We have evidence and so we, you can trust what we say. And what he then goes on to talk about is how religious people don't have evidence. They instead believe things on the basis of tradition. It's what your mum and dad or your grandparents told you and you just believe it because it's old. Or you believe things on the basis of authority. The Pope or your minister told it or the Westminster Confession or, the, or whatever told you it. So it must be true. Uh, or, he says, religious people ultimately believe things on the basis of revelation. And what he, let me read what he says uh, revelation is. When religious people just have a feeling inside themselves that something must be true, even though there is no evidence that it is true, they call their feeling revelation. Okay, so Richard Dawkins, what, what we're doing here today is we're believing something that somebody has felt one, in some place somewhere with no evidence, and we're all kind of accepting that blindly still today. That's actually what he thinks. But that isn't what Mary was being asked to do. Look again at the passage. The angel goes on and he gives Mary two pieces of evidence to help her to believe. Verse 36, the angel says, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month. So there's the first piece of evidence. It's sort of historical evidence. God has done this miracle uh, in Elizabeth, and so you can believe all the things that I've been telling you. So there's the first piece of evidence, historical evidence. The second piece of evidence is in verse 37, and it's sort of more philosophical evidence. The angel points to God and says nothing is impossible with God. So if you have a sense that there is a God, then of course it's not inconceivable that he could do miraculous things. And so those two things together provide evidence to help us to believe what God is saying. So faith has its reasons. We're not, when we become Christians, meant to take our brains out of our heads and put them in a glass jar. We're meant to use our heads to understand the reasons that God gives us for faith. But when we say that faith is stupid, we are saying that true faith actually always makes us look stupid because it involves trusting in something that is beyond our reason. Remember what Calvin said. Um, having faith involves 
uh, willingly becoming fools, in order that we may learn to be wise from the mouth of God. And that's what Mary's showing us, isn't she? She's showing us that although there is evidence to believe, ultimately we have to receive something that's far beyond our ability to understand. We're always going to have questions, but we are to humbly accept what God tells us. Faith is stupid. So that's the first thing uh, I think Mary can show us about faith. We want to imitate Mary's humility. But the second thing that Mary shows us is the power of faith. So have a look at how she responds uh, in verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. Now, I, this is clearly a very powerful statement, isn't it? When you think of all that Mary is being told is going to happen to her, uh, all what the future lies in front of her with being uh, pregnant, without a husband, and all of that, you have to say it's an extraordinarily powerful response with a kind of complete self-possession, with complete poise. She sort of says, okay, let it be to me uh, as you have said. It's a powerful statement, but I actually think the power of faith that is, uh, that is expressed in this statement actually goes a bit deeper than that. And to help us to see this, uh, just, just think a little bit about what Mary's been told. She's been given wonderfully good news, hasn't she? She's been told uh, that she's highly favoured, that the Lord is with her, because through her, the Son of the Most High is going to come into the world. She's been told that this one, her son, the Son of God, is coming to sit on a human throne, the throne of David. He's going to fulfill all the promises made to the prophets that there will be somebody who rises to shepherd God's flock, to give them peace forevermore. All God's promises are going to be fulfilled through her son. Mary's given a, a good word. And what I think Mary is doing when she says, uh, may it be to me as you have said, is she is receiving, if you like, that word into her life and into her heart. She's saying, yes, I want all those good things to be for me. I want to be involved in that. I want your goodness, your promises, your work, your son to be with me me. And that, I suggest, is the power of faith. Faith is a God-given ability to receive God's promises and not just leave them out here, but to take them into our hearts, to receive them as ours, and then to rest in them. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. So you see, faith is not simply believing that something is true. It is that, but it is also then receiving that thing that you believe to be true as true for you and wanting it in your life and in your heart and resting in it. Um, our Shorter Catechism defines faith like this. This is a classic definition of faith. Faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace. That means it's a, a gift that helps to save us by which we receive and rest upon Jesus alone for salvation, as he is offered to, to us in the gospel. So just as the angel offered Christ to Mary in his words, and she received that word and said, let it be to me as you've said. Well, that's just what we do. In the gospel, God offers us Christ, his son. And when we have faith, we say with Mary, let it be to me as you have said. Let him be my saviour. Let him be my Lord. May he reign forever and ever and give me peace. And when that happens, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us, Christ comes to dwell in our hearts by faith. And what a, what a beautiful image Mary gives us of that. As she carries Christ in her womb, so when we receive Christ by faith, he dwells in our hearts and brings us to God. 
So faith, I've been trying to think of an illustration for this, and I think maybe you need almost two kind of optical illustrations to really grasp this. One thing that faith does is it's like a pair of spectacles. It corrects our distorted vision of the world and helps us to see things clearly. It, it, it puts down the pride that we carry around in the world and says, okay, I'm going to trust in God and I'm going to accept what he says. So it's like a pair of spectacles correcting our vision of the world. But faith does a bit more than that as well. Faith, I think, enables us to, to understand things that ordinarily we simply wouldn't be able to grasp. No philosopher, no scientist has ever worked out, for example, that, that God is three persons in one being, the Trinity. No philosopher ever worked that out, but, but it's true. And Christians believe it and know it because we have faith. And so you could say faith is a bit like um, one of those uh, telescopes. Um, you know the ones with the big dish and the pointy bit? And they're able to detect things that the human eye can never detect. They receive information coming from outer space and they give us a, a wonderful picture of our galaxies and our universe that we would never be able to see with our own naked eyes. And faith is doing something like that. Faith is a God-given gift that enables us to understand and believe and know things that we would never be able to understand for ourselves. So friends, let me encourage us to pray for the power of faith. Faith may look stupid. It does require humility but it has tremendous power. Faith enabled humble Mary, the teenage girl, to see far more than proud Zechariah, even with all his biblical learning, because she took God's word into her heart. And that's true for us. Even uh, the uh, frailest, most untaught believer knows more than the best scientists could ever discover by themselves. So pray for the power of faith. Let me encourage you today, if you're somebody who's, who's here who's not a believer, to ask God to help you to hear these, these things that I'm saying and for them not to simply be out here, things that might even possibly be true, but to, to understand that these things really are true for you. Ask him to help you accept them to receive them as good news for you. And for those of us who are believers, well, I think Mary would encourage us to pray for God to increase our faith. That's what the apostles pray, isn't it? Lord, increase our faith. The wonderful thing about faith is, is however strong or however weak it is, in, in many ways doesn't matter. Because faith is like a pair of spectacles or a pair of uh, binoculars. The, the, the real thing that you need faith for is to look at whatever it's pointing at, the object of your faith. And so whenever we have faith, as long as it enables us to see Christ as he's offered to us in the gospel and to receive all the good things he, he gives us and to trust in them, as long as we're doing that, whether we've got a strong faith or a weak faith, it doesn't matter because we'll be receiving Christ and we'll be saved. But in another way, it's always going to be better, to, isn't it, to have a, have, a, have a better pair of binoculars, to have a clearer view of, of, of what God is saying to us, to have a, a bigger, uh, more expensive space telescope. And so we should pray for God to increase our faith so that we can see Christ more clearly, so that we can be more confident in all his goodness and be more confident that it is ours. And I, let me suggest that the way that we would do that is to imitate Mary and to really to follow this pattern that she has of receiving what God says to her, asking questions, and then saying, let it be to me according to your word. And so we, we receive what God says, we trust it, but then we, we've got more questions and that's good. So we ask more of God, show us more what this means. And, and God shows us more. And then we say, okay, let it be to me according to your word. And then we ask another question, and so it goes on. Mary, I think, shows us a cycle of how our faith increases. Well, this is how we can share the blessing that Mary enjoyed. 
Uh, Verse 45, blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. We've talked about the stupidity of faith and the power of faith. And that all ultimately leads to the blessing of faith. Mary went to Elizabeth's house. She found Elizabeth with child, just as the angel said. And Elizabeth, Zechariah's husband, gives this blessing to Mary. Faith brings blessings because Christ really was born of Mary. He sits now on David's throne and all God's promises are yes in him. Blessed is she or he who has believed that what the Lord has said to them will be accomplished. Let me encourage us this Christmas to humbly receive Christ to dwell in our hearts by faith. And so through him and with him be praise and authority to the Father with the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. The carol uh, calls us to uh, pray these words, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. Our fathers, we hear the good things that you spoke to Mary and the good way that she responded with a humble but powerful faith. We pray that... um, that her faith would be echoed in our hearts, that we too would receive Christ and all the good things that come with him as we trust ourselves into your faithfulness and into your power and into your goodness. So our Father, we pray that you will increase our faith, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.